Hello, world. You're listening to Feel Good, the podcast. I'm your host, Malika Lee. And today I have with me a wonderful guest that you all, I think, will, um, you'll, she's going to drop some nuggets on us. I, I just have this feeling. Her <laughs> name <laughs> Her name is Abiola Akini. And she is the founder of Trap Vinyasa. Yes. Um, I'll just shout out a couple of things at the beginning. You can find her on Instagram, anywhere where there's some social media basically Mm -hmm. available. She has a presence there. So you can find her on Instagram and Twitter at yoga by Viola, B-I-O-L-A. Or you could also find her under Trap Vinyasa handle. And she's also on Facebook yoga by biala biala (laughs) so sorry and trap vinyasa on facebook and then her websites www.yogabybiala.com and (laughs) www.trapvinyasa my people butcher my name all the time so i'm very i try to be very sensitive with that it's all good that website www.trapvinyasa.com so today we uh, are going to be talking about body positivity. Mm. Since since we're both women, I think it's probably going to skew to the female side, although I do want to acknowledge up front that I'm sure that men have issues. Yeah, we got to think about the brothers. That's right, right. We got we to gotta bring them into the fold that they have issues, you know, about maybe being buff enough or, you know, all these other things as well. So mm-hmm. although we aren't directly possibly talking about you all, like we want to keep you in mind and bring you into this conversation and acknowledge that we all are dealing with things on one level or another. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so I'd like to just jump right in, shall yes, we? Let's do it. Okay. So let's talk about, there's so many things specifically, let's just say, first of all, that the beauty industry in 2019 was estimated at 532 billion with a b wow dollars billion and i was like does this include plastic surgery i don't think it does mm. um plastic surgery they say in america that basically are innovative and in new ways of shaping our bodies with in, um minimally invasive cosmetic procedures have increased forms of plastic surgery by 200% since 2000. Mm -hmm. And so there are all of these different ways now that we can just, if we can pay for it, Mm -hmm. that we can change and alter ourselves. And so body positivity, just so that we have, you know, a baseline, because this was not a term that I've really heard before our conversation today. Body positivity is a social movement rooted in the belief that all human beings should have a positive body image while challenging the ways in which society presents and views the physical body. And so this movement advocates for the acceptance of all bodies, no matter the form, size, or appearance. Okay, so now that we have that as our foundation, Mm -hmm. what has been your body journey? And I've, of course, I think every single woman and everybody who has a body, right, has had one, so I'll probably... Uh, add some of my experiences in as well. I think those, I'm just thinking about those statistics. I think <laughs> those statistics are are so wild. And it makes me think too, when we look at um, plastic surgery, do we cut that out as body positivity? For mm. me, I had to ask myself the question. Um, I have friends who've had plastic surgery. Does that mean that they're not body positive, and I don't think that's the case at all. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I've really began to learn and understand with this term body positive is that it's completely subjective, mm-hmm. and that the individual gets to define what body positivity is for them. One of my friends, um, Claire, she defines body positivity as body curiosity. Mm-hmm. She completely changed the term for herself and gives herself permission to be curious in her body, and that looks different for her. And so, you know, I think that once I began to receive that body positivity is subjective and can be defined by what I feel like it looks and feels like for me, Mm -hmm. um, I really became empowered by that term because one of the reasons why, you know, I utilize it in trap vinyasa or chose to call trap vinyasa a body positive you know experience yoga experience or hip-hop yoga community was because at the time body positive body positivity had become such a cliche 
term, but I didn't really feel like you could really, no one was really describing how to embody it. Mm -hmm. Just like when people say, love yourself. And or you're like, self-care. Okay, yes. Well, what, is, what does that mean, mm -hmm. you know? For me, growing up, I dealt with a lot of insecurities growing up. I was very insecure about my body, and I had a very strong self-hate mm. uh, towards myself growing up. Um, I was always a very awkward child. I've, I've talked about this <clears throat> pretty openly. I was always awkward growing up. I was very emotional as a child. And I think that confused my mom because I was the only one who was the way that way. Mm -hmm. I was also um, depressed as a child. I was just very unhappy and emotionally needy, which my mom felt, I think she felt kind of stressed by it and and maybe a little bit worried and anxious on my behalf and how I might walk around, how I would get through, you know, life. being an adult and yeah. life with that type of attitude. And it kind of moved to my body. I had some, you know, some sexual molestation when I was young. And moving from Atlanta to Washington State was also difficult because I developed curves at a young age. Mm -hmm. So I had hips and a booty. And How old were you when you started developing? Um, I want to say I was probably around... 10 or 11 oh 10. so elementary school still. I started to I started to mm -hmm. like I didn't get breaths but I started to get hips mm -hmm. and I just you know I was also athletic by the time I was in middle school I was running track and so I got like that just made me even thicker mm -hmm. and I just considered myself really fat I really struggled with being a dark-skinned girl um, I was I was really severely bullied and I talk about this also very openly really badly bullied where we had to change schools but you know this is why I always felt very othered because I was I was really bullied by um white girls and white boys this is know, in Seattle in Seattle and mm -hmm. as well as um black children as well mm -hmm. like who would make fun of me for being African and mm -hmm. you know people would spit I would have people spit on me there what? was yeah it was bad girl People want to say this is 1955, what you're describing. No. They can't see you. What time period are we talking? Girl, this was in high school, but high school and middle school, you know, early 2000s. It was bad. And wow. It was, it, was, it was by white and black kids, you know. Where, where high school, if you don't mind mentioning? I went to, well, I went to Olympic View Middle School, which mm -hmm. is a Mukilteo. So that's where we, we moved when we moved here. Well, one of the places we moved to. And um, Kamiak High School, which is also in Mukilteo, okay. predominantly white, really kind of well off. Mm -hmm. And um, I really struggled there. And I had really bad anxiety. And so my mom relocated me to Mariner High School, which mm -hmm. was more of a black high school. I started to do better there. Um, but... Those first years at Kamiak and at my middle school were really, really bad. It sounds terrible. Yeah, it was, it was bad. It was bad. And I was really ashamed to be, to be dark-skinned. Mm -hmm. Really, like, badly. Really bad. And that um, was really frustrating, and I found myself comparing, and that's what started to get me to use you know, because the, the drugs that I was choosing made me feel so confident that it just felt very like a logical, easy choice mm -hmm. to make. Like, this is what I've been looking for. You know, it just it was an easy yes at that time. Was there a sense of belonging associated with it as well? Like who the people you were using with? That came much later, but for more, for me, because I, you know, not so much, because I would I was a function I function with it, you know. I do use before, you know, school and college. I, you know, I'd go be, to class high, mm -hmm. you know, and so for me, it just made me feel so confident as I moved throughout my day, and my insecurity was debilitating. Like I had really bad problems. Like I was overly perspirating. Um, really bad anxiety in high school, like so bad, like just sweating all day, like just not wanting to like be the bunt of somebody's joke, mm -hmm. like 
taking different pathways and in, in the hallways just so that, you know, the people who would really come after me wouldn't find me. Wow. Yeah. That's really intense. And my parents, like, my mom didn't know until I finally told her. Mm-hmm. And then that's when I said, can, can you transfer me? Can I go to another school? Yeah. And she finally did. Um, but when she didn't said really know. She, you kept it from her. Was there some shame or something associated with it? Or? I was teenage angst, but I was like mad at my mom. And mm-hmm. I felt like I couldn't really be who I wanted to be. And also, I just didn't have that relationship with her. I didn't have that relationship with her where that would make me feel like I could go to her and explain. I hear you. And be like, hey, this is happening, you mm-hmm. know. So I didn't, even, it didn't even, I didn't even think about going to her. It just got so bad where I was like, I need to switch schools. And yeah. I finally asked her. I hear you. So you mentioned you started using, what? how old were you? Were you in high school at that Towards time? Towards the end of high school is when I started using. Do you mind me asking what you were using? Yes. Okay. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I was just abusing a lot of different drugs. Okay. And um, different things. I definitely had a drug of choice, but um, just, you know, abusing different things. And um, I, like I said, it just made me feel confident. And it just made me feel like oh, how some of my, the girls I would know who were like light skin and get all the guys it just and how they would just like almost float into rooms it just Mm. it just made me feel like that yeah i knew i dealt with some colorism a lot of colorism issues and it came from other black people that's the Mm -hmm. irony like the person was a friend of mine who um her mother's from mississippi though Mm -hmm. and she is a beautiful chocolate like deeper complexion than me and um, she told me, I think we were in sixth or seventh grade, and she was like, you're pretty to be dark-skinned. See? Yeah. And I would get those a lot as well. Mm-hmm. Or um, I would get clowned for being dark-skinned a lot as well. Or I'd be clowned for talking a certain way or African booty scratcher, you know, all of the things. And I, you know, it was very, it was very hurtful for me and it took me a long time to be okay with being dark skinned. How, so how did that begin to turn around? Because some people never get over, mm-hmm. over that, yeah. you know, over that trauma, over that, um, I want to say it's almost like a, this is going to date me, but like the record player where you just keep repeating the same thing over and over again in your mind. Absolutely. So how did it begin to start turning around for you? Well, when I was graduating college, well, before that I started to practice yoga. I started practicing yoga in 2006, a little bit. When now, 20, when I went to when I went to college, I started grad. When I went to college, I started practicing yoga, and it was very physical for me. Um, I had gotten into a car accident that effed up my back, mm-hmm. and they gave me a lot of drugs, which was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, probably not the time, but. Right, not probably the best no, for yeah, you. Yeah, because it just exacerbated my problem. But then I also was not able to, like, be as athletic as I was, mm-hmm. like, not run and stuff for the time. And so one of my roommates told me to go to hot yoga, and I did, and I loved it. Yeah. And I, hot I, yoga is training for warriors. Yeah. Let me tell you. <laughs> I loved it, and I can be very type A. And so I love the heat. I love the cardiovascular mm-hmm. um, push. Um, but it quickly became something else. I started to, you know, when I was doing Bikram at the time, which is, you know, 26 set postures mm-hmm. for 90 minutes. You're doing the Tell same Tell them postures. the temperatures, the range. It's like 100 to 104? Hundred, yeah, it's about 100 to 104 degrees, sometimes higher. Fahrenheit. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's hot. And um, you're doing those same postures. There's no music, so you really start to hear my self-talk became very apparent to me and I had never heard it before. Mm. Um, you're doing the same movements, so you really start to hear what you're saying. Mm-hmm, like meditation. Too. Mm-hmm. It's a moving meditation, yeah. so you start to hear yourself. Mm-hmm. And I remember doing one specific posture that I was very egotistical about. I had finally nailed it. I was really strong in it. It was a big posture, and I fell out of it pretty dramatically Mm. and there's tears in Bikram yoga so the back is newbies middle is intermediate and the beginning the front of the room is the advanced so I was in the front Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And I felt I fell out of the posture pretty drastically. And I remember what I said to myself. I was like, you like effing bitch, mm-hmm. you failure or something. I remember it so clearly. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, wow, did I just say that to myself? Mm-hmm. And I started to hear it more and more. Wow. And I developed this ability to just, I started to just sit with it. And I didn't know I was meditating at the time. So I'd sit with these things that I was saying with myself. And I started to ask, why do you feel that way? Where did that come from? And my... I'm just going to interrupt for just a moment. We're going to have the listeners on a little bit of a cliffhanger. Just have to do a little housekeeping if you're just tuning in. (laughs) You're listening to Feel Good, the podcast on 105.7 FM KVRU. And we are talking about body positivity with Abiola um, Akini, who is the founder of Trap Vinyasa. And she's sharing with us her journey, uh, as you just heard, of getting to a place of being aware of her basically negative talk Mm -hmm. and abusive. It sounds really harsh and abusive. Yeah. um, Talk. It was very Mm self-deprecating. I started to sit with it and start to, in my meditation and ask myself, where do things come from? Well, who told you that? Where did you get that from? And spirit would just guide me deeper and deeper to where the root of things. And when I got to the root, it just dissipated. Mm -hmm. It just it was like a matted ball that just began to dissolve and I started to put in different beliefs. But once I got to the root of it, it wasn't that I could just put in a different like affirmation on top. It was I got to the root of it and realized and that the belief that I had was not true. Mm-hmm. So it had no choice but to go away because I no longer believed that lie. Yeah. And so I could put in an affirmation and it could stick. Mm-hmm. Right. Not trying to put on top. It's mm-hmm. like putting icing on a mud pie if you haven't cleaned out the tin. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Or new wine and old wine skins. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know? And so I started to do that practice a lot. And I did it agnosium. I started to realize it was like how, what it was doing to me. And I would I would just sit and I would close my eyes and I would start with one question, one tr- piece of trauma. And then I would just shave it all the way Mm. down to the root and that is how this alchemization this Mm. literally alchemizing my trauma into an ascension point so I can talk about all this stuff no shame Mm -hmm. no shame Mm -hmm. you know where before I would feel so much shame and embarrassment you know I've alchemized that I don't have that heaviness belt stuff from the past anymore and then I started to really enjoy being in my sensory body, you know, your emotional body is where it's kind of stuck in the past or the before, future. Before we go there, I had a question for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you were saying about how you would alchem- alchemize it and you would shave it down, right? Like you would take one thing at a time. When you say shave it down, what was the mental process or what was what were those steps? What did that look it's like? It's hard because it's not a, it's not, it's, it it's can't not be steps. quantified by steps. It's yeah. meditation. Mm-hmm. I would literally sit. Mm-hmm close my eyes, drop into my breath, and ask myself one question, and spirit would guide me to getting it down to the root. Okay. That is the, it's the beauty of meditation Mm -hmm. when you're just in the stillness of your breath and multiple forms of meditation. There's so many different meditations. I would use breath meditation to get me to sit with myself, Mm -hmm. and then what I would let what come up comes up Mm -hmm. and because I was laden with trauma I was getting a lot of trauma that was coming up okay so I just sit with the trauma one piece at a time one the most blaring so it's digestible by taking it one one at once at it one at a time and then I'm assuming there's probably emotions Mm -hmm. that would come up sometimes or no not really sometimes I would cry but I would be in my meditation I would cry I just Mm -hmm. keep being in my meditation Mm -hmm. I just keep just stay there and I'd come out of it, yeah, tears, like, wow, I didn't know that's what I thought about myself, or I didn't, you know, I, I'm i sad that I let that person do that to me because that's how I felt about myself, mm-hmm. or, you know, all these revelations were coming. Yeah. Thank you for taking that step back. I just wanted to, to get it, to de- delve in because that was such an important turning point. Right. In your journey. Yeah. And I think it's very hard for people to sit with what they feel ashamed about. Yes. 
because they're taught not to look at it. And I was doing the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. I was looking at it myopically. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to see every nook and cranny from where it came from to how it grew to who gave it to me to where I choose to, where I chose to take it. Yeah. That takes courage. It, yeah. And, and not to run from it. Cause that's what we can do with TV. I mean, there's so many different outlets mm -hmm. that we can distract ourselves mm -hmm from those things. Yeah. So thank you for walking us through a little bit more of what that was like for you. And okay. So then you cleared it all out. You're saying it transformed my, it transformed my inner being mm -hmm. um, and allowed me to see my light and that mm. there was a natural high when I would use, I would be bubbling over. Mm -hmm. It was too much because I didn't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. I was so full. Yeah. You know, one of the last times I used, I was just crying all the whole time because I'm just like, this is like, I can feel the fakeness of this high. Mm. And I had never gotten to that point where I could, it didn't feel, it, fi it felt so artificial. Yeah. And I had finally had real, I had real fullness, um, a love from spirit that was so full, nothing, everything, I could just feel everything artificial. Wow. And so... From there, I really started to explore sensuality. And once again, that because when you suffer sexual trauma, you just can only identify as a sexual being. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to feel like your body is something that is yours, you know. And so when you only see yourself as a sexualized being, it's easy to connotate your body in ownership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I started to explore, you know, diving into my yoga practice, exploring meditation and even Christ consciousness, I really drew, you know, dove into the sensory body, which is the now body. Mm -hmm. And when I would draw into the sensory experience, I was alive to myself and it brought the ownership of my body back to myself. Mm -hmm. and, and when you say the now experience, you mean like being fully present into what's right. happening in your body right now? Because when you're, when you are with your senses, you are not in the past or the future mm -hmm. you're feeling the wind you're tasting you're touching you're smelling you are in your now body you're feeling which is a now term mm -hmm. you know versus when I was in my emotional body living in my trauma constantly you know there was a time where I felt like afterward when I had alchemized so much of it I kept living in my emotional body mm -hmm. my pain body because I was like I need to live here as a constant reminder so I don't do it again mm -hmm. And it's like, no, why would you put yourself through that torture of only living in that body, which is a lack body? There's no abundance there. Mm -hmm. So, and my teacher taught me that. And so I started to really have it be in my sensory body, my now body. But there was a time for me to be in my emotional body, my trauma body. Mm -hmm. And then there was a time for me to be in my now body. And I started to be in that sensory body, having a sensory experience. Yes. It's also like a mindfulness practice. I know. Mm -hmm. um, several mindfulness practices, which is just like being aware of, you know, how you're sitting in the seat and, and how your feet are resting on the floor. And, and so how you're feeling exactly how you're feeling. So yeah. giving myself permission, my, my body positivity became a practice of permission, mm. giving myself permission. I feel angry to feel that if I feel sad to feel that if I feel joy to feel that mm -hmm. and um, to create boundaries if needed based on the, what I'm feeling. And that's so interesting that, you know, we're talking about body positivity and and we got into the realm of the other bodies, the emotional body. It didn't right? have the my body positivity never really had anything to do with my physical body. Mm -hmm. It always the work was always started from the inside. Mm. It never had anything to do with like my fit. That's why. Trap Vinyasa, I call it a body positive because people think it's like this very visceral sexual practice and it, and people take it and that's why they I would I don't know or convert it or love it because <laughs> it is it the philosophy is it has nothing to do with the physical mm. the body positive is completely within the sensory and the emotional body interesting okay so say more about that because like the body positivity in, in the way that you're saying it, it, it makes me question like the bo body positivity term that I set up the show with, where it talks about the acceptance and the embrace of all shapes, forms, sizes, that it, everything is 
great, A-OK. And how would you say it or when you use the term, it sounds like you mean it in a different way. So I do but yeah. remember when you posed that, I said, it, you know, it's, it's subjective. Mm -hmm. For some women who have bigger bodies, body positivity is very physical for them mm -hmm. because they're learning how to come to a place of accepting and enjoying their bodies, knowing that their bodies don't fit the stereotype of, you know, of attraction in society. You know, for some people, it's it's going to be different. I think that... How was it for you? What would you say was your body positivity, if it's subjective, like what's your personal? Mm -hmm. For me, it was experience. always internal. Mm -hmm. Loving myself from the inside. Mm -hmm. And that's where my work began because I didn't have that self-love. And I didn't know what that was. And so body positivity for me has has been this process of learning myself from the inside out and mm -hmm. giving myself permission to feel what I feel and that includes not always feeling positive about my physical body yeah because I don't always feel positive about it sometimes I don't feel good about it mm -hmm. I don't like the way I look or you know, I'll do certain things to make myself look a certain way. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll give myself permission to be in that place. And yeah. it's become a practice of permission. Mm -hmm. And allowance and not resisting mm -hmm. any of those things. So I know that your body positivity journey has been in one of inside. And I'm wondering how, as you changed inside, what effect it had on how you treated your physical body? It had a huge effect um, from the food that I ate. It's so funny because I cook a lot, and mm -hmm. I'm sure my sisters and my roommates from college laugh because I would buy food and have my roommates cook it because <laughs> I didn't I didn't know how to cook. Where'd you find these wonderful roommates? That's nice. They cook it for you. I would be like, "Can y'all help me?" Because I didn't know how to cook and I didn't have the patience to want to learn. And you know, I was very gluttonous, mm -hmm. and so. I was eating beyond satiation, and I would have really bad stomach cramps and bloating, and I've always had really y unique gut issues. Um, uh, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't call it IBS, but like um, heartburn and all these different things. Like they had to do some stuff in my stomach when I was younger, like put a little tube to check what was happening. Mm -hmm. And I would just push beyond that and just, you know, be super gluttonous when I ate what I would eat. And now I cook almost every meal and um, I'm super mindful about what I eat how I eat um, what am I how, how much I'm eating mm -hmm. and uh, I pay very close attention to what makes me feel good um, no, pun, <laughs> no pun intended to the name of the podcast but what makes me feel good I feel very pay close attention to what makes me feel lethargic and heavy and avoid it. And um, I always, I obviously, you know, everyone treats themselves, but I'm very mm -hmm. mindful about what I put in my body. I train, I weight train a lot, but you know, I also still am working on how to take care of my physical body mm -hmm. um, because sometimes I ignore it yeah, and push it. I'm a pusher. And one of the things I've really learned as of 2020 and last year is that um, how you love yourself is going to be very uh, emblematic and correlate to how you see someone as loving you. So with partners in the past, if they pushed me, almost terrorized me, mm -hmm. because that's how I am to myself, I would see it as love. Mm. And realizing, like, that's not really love to mm -hmm. push yourself beyond your own boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, so really being mindful and intentional about cultivating love and patience, being patient with myself, not pushing myself in my work, um, giving myself open spaces of time where I don't do anything. Um, just little things like, I'll be quick to pick up one thing while I'm putting down the next, never having, let, allowing the moment to have its full expression, you know, um, impatience. And 
recently I've like found myself getting into this idea of like picking up some form of media in between these open spaces Mm -hmm. and really giving myself time to go back to that where I didn't need that. Yeah. Um, because I want to ensure that I'm in, I'm embodying love so that I can recognize and discern how another being is embodying love and make sure that it's a, a beautiful frequency Mm -hmm. when we come into exchange and that we can have a love relationship that is edifying, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and that edifies both of us. And so, you know, this expression of body positivity has now come into the physical and it's actually the hardest part for me. It's it's harder for me. The other stuff was super easy for me to do. The changing the diet and everything. Or the insight, the the meditation. Yes, that too. The insight, like... The alchemization, the meditation, mm-hmm. the sitting with, which can be so uncomfortable for, for people. For a lot of people. Just, yeah. you know, sit with themselves, be by themselves. That was super easy for me. Mm-hmm. It's the other stuff that has been hard for me. Um, so that's a that's a practice that I'm learning. But once again, it's a permission. So mm-hmm. if it's off for that day or for that hour, I mm-hmm. give myself permission when you say it's hard for you, like which part of the, the, the outer that you're talking about? Can you just give us an example? Mm. Being satisfied mm. mm-hmm. with uh, my physical body. Got it. People could look at me and say, she's so fit. And I still hear a lot of the stuff from my days where I was being bullied. Mm-hmm. You know, and so... And I still look at myself like that girl when I would look in the mirror and see how they would look at me. Mm -hmm. I see that still sometimes. And that's okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I no longer hold myself to a standard of perfection. I think I'm in, in all my imperfections, I'm perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me this quirky kind of individual that is very relatable and authentic is because, um, I'm okay with that, that perfection. I, I don't, I don't even believe it anymore. So mm-hmm. it's not even something I, I put in my mind because it doesn't, I know I don't, be, I don't have that belief. I don't yeah. hold myself to that belief, but I do want to be perfect in the eyes of what society says. Like I, I still want that. I want, I want that. I want, you know, how I see, you know, some women walking and they're so confident and, you know, so beautiful according to societal standards. There's a term, one of our, um, one of our, not goals, but not missions. What is the word? Um, like values. Vision, values. Mm-hmm. For trap. We have a set of values as wild beauty. <laughs> it's called wild beauty. And mm-hmm. it's this idea of you can be beautiful when you're blooming and when you're wilting. Mm. And this society has this idea that we can only be beautiful when we're blooming, when right. we're made up, when we're at what we could what society would consider our best. Mm-hmm. And also beauty that is not um you know like typical to you know to societal standards in terms of like the light skin with the curly hair right Mm -hmm. now there's all these curly curly you know the curly yes and um i have a lot of women who are dark skin and letting themselves be wild Mm -hmm. there's a beauty in the wildness of your kink you know Mm -hmm. of your curls Mm -hmm. and this wild, untamed beauty, which I've given myself permission to completely exist in, as you can ex- see looking <laughs> at me, coming from the fashion world, I was never, I was made up mm-hmm. at all times. And um, giving myself permission to be, to be wild and to be, let people see me when I'm in my stages of wilting. Yeah. You know, can you handle me when I'm wilting? Because then maybe you can handle me when I'm blooming. Because when I'm blooming, it's on fleek, honey. Right. I don't know if right. you can keep up with it. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I give myself permission. Mm-hmm. That's been my permission and insight has been my process of body positivity. 
So you've mentioned um, several things about working from the inside out. I'm just wondering if someone's listening and they've heard your journey and they know that they don't have the greatest relationship um, with any level of their being, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what would be some things that that you would encourage them to do? Like you've mentioned sensuality. You've mentioned a couple of different things on your walk. Are there other things that you would just like to bring forward for other other people to consider? Absolutely. One of the things is if you're really, which I understand where you're really in that place of um, self-hatred or just un completely and utterly unsatisfied with your body, whether that be physical or emotional, two things, metaphysical and physical, I would start a movement practice mm -hmm. that goes beyond um, working out, that isn't about working out. Um, so that's how Trap Vinyasa started, it was just a movement practice. Mm -hmm. So that could be being at home and just finding, like, turning on your favorite song and Oh, you could call it dancing, but I like this idea of getting on all fours and just like rolling around in cat cow, like rolling <laughs> on the floor. Yeah. You know, um, movement, just being in your body mm -hmm. and then sitting by yourself, mm -hmm. sitting alone in silence, no social media, nothing, and starting a sit practice, a meditation practice. Mm -hmm. And people always say meditate, but no, sit and let your trauma reveal itself. Mm. And when that first piece comes up, ask, where did you come from? Mm -hmm. And that is you convening with spirit. Mm -hmm. You are sitting with spirit and giving spirit the opportunity to help you heal. To come in and help you heal side by side. Mm -hmm. I will guide you through this trauma and giving you and do through the guidance, giving you the tools or not even giving you the tools, giving you the ability to see where it came from. And when you can see dissolve the belief of it. So starting a sit practice and sitting and letting what comes up, come up and ask, where did you come from? Where did you come from? And then from there, watching what where you're led. Mm -hmm. So a movement practice and a sit practice, a meditation practice. Yeah, those are very, very um, deep. And I, I do both of those and I can relate to, I love dancing. So the, the joy mm -hmm. that can come from those mu those movements and like being, like you're saying, that wild, you know, in full expression. Because when you're dancing or when you're in movement, you're in sensory you're in your now body. You're in your sensory body. When you're dancing and you find that joy, you're not in your trauma. You're not in your emotional body, mm -hmm. your your pain body. Yeah. You're in your sensory body. And so this joy just comes to meet you. And the more you can be in that, the more you can kind of emerge, draw that emergence and allow it to expand throughout your body. Mm -hmm and kind of infiltrate through other areas. So, you know, even, you know, I get a lot of women who come to trap who are just like, oh, I don't know how to dance when we get to the cardio dance in the, in the sequence. But then I see them, mm -hmm. and it, you don't have, you know, every, it's, dancing is subjective. It's all subjective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so once they get and they just, I see them close their eyes and they just start to, they're dancing to let go. That was my stomach this time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to um, to share a couple of mine because uh, the journey of, of like the body positivity, mm -hmm. um, just to offer a, a few things that that I experienced that were that were helpful. Um, one was like a, a practice of looking at myself in the mirror mm -hmm. and finding things that I liked about myself and affirming those because I. It's funny about, you know, like ownership of our bodies mm -hmm. because people think they can just comment on your body all the time. Yes. Women and men. And um, and so then I was like, well, let me comment on it mm -hmm. and affirm it. 
So that was one thing because I, I, um, I'm slender build Mm -hmm. and I always felt like the curvy girls were more attractive. Like I had a lot of guy friends in high school and they would just talk in front of me candidly. And so the women that, or the girls we were in, in teenagers at that time that they were attracted to did not look like me and so I felt invisible Mm -hmm. Uh, for a long time in fact I used to wear a lot of layers clothes to make me look bigger and that was the style also Mm -hmm. but it was um, to make me look bigger and then just within the last couple years I'd say maybe about five or six years it was like I looked in the mirror and I um, just had my underwear on and I was like I'm all right yes you know I'm all right and so I I think Sometimes um, that's part of it. And then the other part of of my journey that's coming up, just to mention, is like really becoming my own lover. Absolutely. And what I mean by that is like going back to the sensuality part. Like there was one day normally, you know, I have natural hair and it can be a lot and take a lot of time. And um, and sometimes I don't wear it out because people I'll just say not just white people, but will touch it without asking. And um, Mm -hmm. that's a whole other thing. But I realized that I didn't touch my hair. The only time I really touched my hair was when I was styling it or and then it was like I was just trying to get done. Mm-hmm. And so one day I was driving and I just started to touch my hair and feel like how soft it was and like the um, pattern of the curl and the way I had it styled. And I was like, wow, because the flashbacks of being tender headed <laughs> and <laughs> crying, you know yes. what I mean? When my mom is combing my hair. <laughs> um that I didn't delight. That. Yeah, I didn't delight in the beauty of it. And so even like touching and feeling the smoothness of, of the skin of my hands, you know, and appreciating how, that that has helped me be more um, embodied mm-hmm. because there's been times I've looked in the mirror and I'm like, whoa, I forgot what I looked like for that day. Mm-hmm. Um, that's on point. The, that's one of the things I actually teach um, to my students within Trap Vinyasa and the Divine Feminine Yoga Workshop is... Um, personal touch mm-hmm. um so really beginning to allow yourself to caress your own body and taking the sexual out of it mm-hmm. but just caressing just um for exploration and enjoyment and then also um seeing yourself as your as a lover mm-hmm. so one of the things that i'll ask a prompt that i'll ask my students i'd like you to see yourself um see your body as your lover today so the way that you pour into your lover mm-hmm. the grace Give that to yourself like you're, you see your body like your lover, like your partner, mm-hmm. you know, and pour into it accordingly, you know, and that's when you start to touch yourself. Sometimes when I'm giving myself my own massage, I, I do it as if like I would for a lover, but I'm, I'm self-massaging mm-hmm. myself, mm-hmm. you know, so beginning to have that relationship, I hear that. Yes, that's awesome. And then I'm going to take it another step forward when I um, was like, okay, I want to be my own beloved. I remember on Valentine's Day, I bought myself some flowers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they bump up the prices on Valentine's Day, like maybe 100%, right? (laughs) So I was looking at that price tag. And I was like, you know what, I could come back tomorrow Mm -hmm. and get the same bouquet for half off. And then I was like, wait a minute, if I was in relationship right now, would I want that? Would he, right. Would Mm -hmm. I be okay if he said, oh, I'm going to get them for you when they're on sale tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I was like, no. So why am I doing that to myself? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, that's one of the things I had to um, start to do for myself too in business Mm -hmm. is to not skimp, to give myself, if I can afford it, give yourself, give yourself your best, the best. Mm -hmm. Don't just go for what's cheap. Give yourself, if I, if I can afford that, then I'm going to do it and feel good when you do it. If you feel bothered by it, then don't. Don't go, my teacher told me, don't go beyond your own boundaries. That's the worst thing you can do to yourself. That's not love. Don't push beyond your boundaries. But if you feel like, I can do this and I'm okay, then do it. Yes. Give yourself the grace when it's available. And if there's a boundary, then don't worry. There'll be another opportunity for you to grow beyond that boundary. Mm, I love that. We're mm-hmm. gonna we're gonna wrap with that. <laughs> yes. You have been listening to a feel good conversation on Feel Good the podcast. I'm your host Malika Lee. My guest today is Abiola Akani. Akani. Yes. Who has started Trap Vinyasa here in Seattle, Washington. And she has a number of ways that you can find her. 
I'll just mention the Trap Vinyasa handle again on Instagram and Twitter. She's also on Facebook and the website where she can be found. Uh, one of the ways is www.trapvinyasa.com. Yes. I just want to thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being a guest on our show and all of the wisdom uh, and generosity of your experiences that you've had today with our with our listeners. Yes, thank you for having me, and I look forward to hearing from all of your beautiful faces soon, hopefully uh, through socials or popping into a class. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and they, your class schedule will be on your Trap Vinyasa. Yes, okay. we've got a lot of things coming up. Um, if you're in Miami, look out for Body Party Miami, May 9th. Um, if you're in Seattle... Look for all of our offerings, and we got more coming for you guys. All right. Until the next time, feeling good. It's it's more than it's a podcast. It's also a movement. And so just do something to bring a smile to your own face today. You don't have to wait for somebody else to make you feel yes. good or, or for your man to read your mind or your woman to read your mind. Or, you know, if you want that chocolate or if you want that good meal, treat yourself. Mm -hmm. Assuming you have the means, mm -hmm. caveat. But treat yourself, you know, in a way that'll make you smile today. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a five-star rating and share it with your friends. Also, if you'd like to support the work, please visit our Patreon page, www.patreon.com.